that resulted in a 10 year difference in lifespan. Now I brewmate mine and I've got animals here that are 30 years, you know, give or take a year or two for both species. So something is, you know, I'm doing something right is, is what I'll say. Um, you know, they're the hardiest reptiles that you can pretty much find commonly in the pet hobby. to episode 9 of the Reptiles and Research podcast, hosted by myself, Liam Sinclair, and Ellie Hills. Today's episode, we had on Francis Koskieri to talk about the Japanese, the Korean, and the Russian rat snake. This is, as you can expect with Francis, a really hyper-detailed episode, um, really, really, really heavy on the Latin taxonomy, natural history, and of course, Francis knows things that no one else does, that isn't a normal thing to remember, but Francis just can just turn up to a podcast and just roll it off. So Francis is one of my favourite guests to have on, because I just love the conversations we have. Before we get into this episode, we'd like to thank Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring the podcast. If you want to upgrade your enclosure or get PVC options for your reptiles, then you can head to the link in the video description or in the show notes if you're listening to this audio only. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can join us on Patreon slash Reptiles and Research and get access to everything behind there. Without further ado, let's get on with today's episode. Hello, Francis. Thank you for coming on the podcast again. At this point, I think you're becoming a regular. <laughs> I think most Hello. people are going yeah. to get used back, to at this point. And uh, obviously, there's going to be audio audio listeners that don't know what you've got in your hands. But at the moment, Francis has already got one of his Russian rat snakes out. Yeah, so this is going to be one of the species that I'll be talking about today. Um, Liam actually pointed out that I'm wearing Russian rat snake colours as well, so it's kind of camouflaging <laughs> black and yellow. So how long is, is this Russian rat snake? This one is getting on to six feet. I have others. I've got one which is almost eight, which is over the much over the average limit. You know, normally they are around, they get to about six feet or so rarely they get up to about 250 centimeters but you know it's it's not usual uh, so about six feet but they're quite stocky for rat snakes um this one is i mean it's not small it's you know it's about six feet about as long as i am tall when you it's all stretched out it is beautiful as well like, i didn't realize how i didn't realize how girthy they were as well yeah um so they're one of the larger elaphri. Um, obviously, you've got, you know, there's, there's like a sort of a, a few species of elaphi that do get over two meters. This is one of them. Um, you've got the beauty snakes, which are probably the longest, if you know, because they used to be all three of this, but now they're elaphi too again. Um, so they definitely are the longest. You've got carinata, which is the king rat snake. They get pretty large as well. I mean, you know, the books all kind of say six, seven feet, but they definitely get more than that. I've seen nine and possibly even 10 footers um, on farms in China, albeit power fed, and they're also very girthy. And then in Europe, you've got the four line snake, Elafe uh, Quattro Lineata, which is also kind of the same size bracket, possibly even girthier, uh, you know, may maybe even weightier than a Russian, but, you know, around the same kind of size. Um, but yeah, Russians are, they're quite large. Um, so for Elafe, they are probably in the top three or four. I would say. Nice. So for all the listeners listening, this episode is going to be focusing on Russian rat snakes, Koreans, and there's another species as well you're lumping in with this section. Yeah, we're going to lump in Japanese rat snakes as well. So uh, Elafe climacophora, just because they're quite closely related and the care is somewhat similar. Uh, and they're from the same general region, Southeast Asia, albeit obviously as the name, <laughs> uh, so we'll tell you from Japan rather than from Russia and China, where the other two are from, but I keep them all in roughly the same way. They require a similar sort of requirement, so it's a safe net to put them all together. And I know that there are quite a few keepers that um, have them all. Cool. So before we jump into that and before we jump the gun, I want to ask, what's going on lately in everyone's collections? I'll let you go first. <laughs> well, my collection is pretty much... Uh, static for the most part, apart from the fact that I've bred, obviously bred the Mexican Blacks and um, I'm playing a, a sister feed game at the moment with those. Congratulations. How are they doing anyway, the babies? 
So some of them have started perfectly and they are like the ones that I think some of them might be holdbacks and then there's some that have refused to eat since they are born and now they've been assist fed and there's like three of them I assist fed last night. They're, they're on like m- mouse tails and we'll see how that goes. But for the most part, doing all right. Um, I've split half the clutch with UV and half of not, so I've been playing around that as well. Are you going to any kind of differences? Um, I definitely noticed them bask. They bask constantly. They're literally always sat at the end just curled up along that edge as well there's literally an entire other area if they can go um, and they're literally purposefully sitting under that UV which I find really interesting um, not that I don't expect them to bask I think I know from the adults seeing them bask all the time but um, it's just cool seeing a little tiny little shoelace bask but other than that my collection option, you know. just another option yeah basically but other than that yeah my collection's static I'm working on the Bitter Dragon Deep Dive um, Nuggets getting some upgrades and whatnot. And I've got a joint project with Ellie now, which I'm sure Ellie will be the one to to uh, disclose since it's all at hers. Oh, <laughs> my ever-changing collection. Um, yeah, I we've got two bearded dragons, um, which are lovely and cute and tiny at the moment. Um, they're doing really well and settling in. And then I'm also going to have fun doing um, target training and feed station training with those guys to have a bit of fun. Um, I've had a clutch of royal pythons hatch, which are all feeding and doing great, um, which we found quite funny because the royals were meant to be the difficult feeders and they've all got feeding before Liam's. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, It's like king snakes are supposed to be the easy ones. <laughs> yeah, and then like mine have literally taken first offering. So, yeah. Result. Liam. <laughs> That's like the, the doom rolls supposed to be diff- tricky feeders, and I literally had them feeding straight away. But my own king snakes, however, are supposed to be the beginner, <laughs> easy to feed things. Apparently, they're the ones that give me trouble. Did they assist feed well? What did you um, feed them? Mouse tails? Mouse tails, yeah. Literally, it's quite easy. Once they get the hang of it, it should be okay. Weirdly enjoyed it as well. I really found it therapeutic to, as a fiddly thing. I was, li- I was like, why don't why do I enjoy this? Like, It's weird, but I did. I suppose it, it takes stress away once you've actually got something that you know hasn't eaten and it's like, oh, now it's got something inside it, even if it's, you know, you, you want it to have more, but at least it's got something. Yeah, it was definitely like a new skill learned. I think that's why I enjoyed it, because I was like, oh, I just figured that out. Like, that's that's there for next time now. I'm sure you're going to have a long list of what's going on in your collection now. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's been quite a productive year, actually. I mean, uh, I'm not really a breeder as such. I breed animals as a matter of course, you know, it just happens. I've had a fairly good year. I've bred Russian rat snakes earlier this year. Uh, sadly, I missed a clutch of Korean rat snakes because they're at um, the, the adult pair at uh, my mum's house, and I missed the eggs, unfortunately, whilst I was on holiday. Uh, I've had a few clutches of Japanese rat snakes, a few clutches of twin spotted rat snakes, um, which and they, they went up to Chaz, some corn snakes as, you know, half of the core. Um, Madagascar Ophis, so the um, Madagasi cat eyed snakes. I've got some babies in the other room. Samophis shokari, the sand uh, shokari sand snakes. I think we spoke about last time, and I'm sure there's something else. How's that little coach whip doing? That's the one, the coach whips. Uh, so yeah, they're doing well. A um, couple of them sadly hatched out with kinks. I'm not sure if that was because of how they were incubated, but the rest of them are doing okay, and there are a bit of uh, issues getting them feeding. I've got to admit, um, you know, they're, they're quite difficult to get started on rodents. Uh, I've tried feeding them with insects, so I've, I've put some crickets in. A couple have disappeared. I've never actually seen them eat an insect, but the insects do disappear. Um, a couple of them are now eating, you know, assist feeding rot really well. Uh, you just sort of... What I do is rather than shoving it in their mouth, because they're quite strike happy, uh, I pin them. So I put them out on a flat surface and I pin them mid-body and they start sort of S-shaping and uh, getting ready to strike at what comes near. And if you, uh, with the forceps, move the a pinky in front of them and they bite it, they start chewing, you know, they'll, they'll do their danders to kill it. And if you're really, really quiet um, and you just really gently sort of let go and move slowly back with the, uh, with the stealth of Drax, <laughs> uh, usually it will carry on eat, you know, they'll carry on eating now and uh, swallow them down, but it's, uh, it's finicky and s- stressful and annoying. But, and those will go to Drayton Manor uh, at some point once I'm sort of satisfied that they are doing okay. That's about it, really, for this year. But it's a you know, sort of mixed mixed bag. A few lizards as well. Geckos are always hatching, but 
They're for a different purpose. We won't go into that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that sadly it's need, needs must. I have a couple of snakes that require lizards, so that's just how it is, uh, unfortunately. But so everyone's having quite quite a good year then. Yeah. We'll see how it gets to moving on these animals, but anyway, well, that'll be for another day. So let's begin diving into. Which species do you want to do first? I assume Russian, since you've got a Russian in your hands. That makes yeah, more sense. Start. I mean, I've got all species here, so I can bring them out from the bigger bits. But um, so, yeah, uh, shall we talk about the three? So, Russian um, rat snakes, Elafe Shrenki, named for the Russian um, naturalist Leopold von Schrenk, I believe, who's quite a celebrated naturalist. Uh, we'll talk about Elafe Anomala, uh, which is the Korean rat snake. Um, Anomala basically means weird or different. Uh, because that actually used to be considered a subspecies of the Russian rat snake. And some people still do, but we'll talk a little bit about the taxonomy. Um, and then Elafe climacophora, uh, which I believe means um, climbing, a love of climbing. So climacophobia is a phobia of climbing. I believe climacophora means just rat snake that climbs, um, which is the Japanese rat snake. Um, if we talk about Elafe Shrenki and Elafe Anomala first, which are the Russian and the Korean rats. We are, we basically better get the elephant out of the room first. Are they one species or are they two species? And depending on who you speak to, you get different answers. I'm very much of the opinion they're two different species. Um, I'll, I'll get that out of the way at the beginning. Some people still believe that they are, that Anomala is and was a subspecies of Shrenki. Uh, but that's a debate that's been going back like nearly 100 years. I know that uh, Bullinger, you know, very famous taxonomist Bullinger, was for uh, Anomala being a different species. Um, and I know that Clifford Pope, in his 1935 book on snakes of China, argued that, says that the there was no morphological characters that actually distinguished the two other than coloration, which is quite an obvious character. I mean, Russian rats from Russia, the ones in the hobby that we call Russian rats, that's, that's what we'll get into, like this one, are the black and yellow, which some people call the poor man's mangrove snake. And the people that say that, I mean, these are much better than mangrove snakes. I'm sorry, I've, I've kept and bred mangroves for years too. They're boring. Russian rat snakes are, as far as I'm concerned, tied for the best mm -hmm. pet snakes in the world with maybe Dion's. It depends. If you like smaller snakes, Dion's rat snakes. If you like them a bit bigger, you know, six or seven feet, Russian rat snakes. But they're both hardy extremely docile, uh, extremely easy to keep, breed readily. They're just ideal, you know, they're active. They're just ideal pets. Um, but yeah, so I believe that Clifford Pope did mention that there was one structural difference between Shrenky and Anomala, which was the hemipenal morphology and that Shrenky lacks a ridge running parallel to the sulcus spermaticus in the you know, along the uh, hemipenes, which Anomala does have. Other than that, they're indistinguishable. And if you look at the juveniles, because there's quite a big ontogenetic change, uh, you know, from juvenile to adult. Although some people say that they can tell, I don't really believe you can. Um, you know, juveniles of both species are pretty indistinguishable. Some people say that Russians start out darker. I disagree. I've had very, very pale baby Russians. And I've had very, very dark baby Korean rats. So I would not visually be able to tell you with any kind of certainty from just looking at a baby, um, you know, which species it was. Although in general, yeah, Russians are generally a little bit darker, but it's not a definite trait. Um, so this is where we get to the real difficulties. So in the hobby, the Russian rat snake is the one that's labeled Elafe Shrenki, which is the black and yellow one. The Korean rat snake is the one labeled Elafe Anomala, which is the generally brown one, basically brown on brown um, or brown on gray. Therein lies a the problem because even back in the 30s, up until the 80s, Clifford Pope mentions that Korea, the Korean peninsula, was an area of intergradation between the two species, where you get darker Korean rat snakes and lighter Russian rat snakes. And I've been sent, you know, because I've, I've written articles about these species before, and I was very kindly loaned pictures by a number of people, such as uh, Shin Yuichol, Amel Borze, Kim Hyuntai from Korea itself. 
And when you start actually seeing pictures of the snakes on the Korean peninsula, they look like Korean rat snakes, they're laughing anomaly. But genetic studies show that they're actually shrinky, they're Russians. So the, the, the snakes on Korea look like Korean rat snakes, but are actually Russian rat snakes. Um, so it's, it's a really uh, a difficult taxonomic sort of mess. Now, there was a fellow called Byers in 1962 um, who wrote that about 10 years earlier, he had collected an unusual specimen from South Korea, which he ascribed to Anomala. But basically, the genetic work recently by the likes of Zhou Zhengyan, Wen Ge Zhao, and Peng Liu kind of as a, a, ascribed the Korean peninsula animals under Shrenki. So the Korean animals are Russian rat snakes. North Korea is a bit difficult. So that's South Korea. North Korea is a bit difficult because obviously it's a bit more closed. So there is an, there are at least one old record by Clifford Pope of a Korean rat snake caught, uh, I think it was Ping Yuan, um, from the 80s. My friend Amel Borze has mentioned that naturalists from North Korea at, at you know, events have actually displayed familiarity with both species. So it could be that both species do occur in Korea, but it would require further work. So if we're gonna look at, at the distribution, um, and again, Kevin Messenger has done an excellent piece on this in his recent book, uh, The Asian Rat Snakes or the, or the Chinese Rat Snakes, which I recommend if you're interested in, in snakes of that region. Um, if you're looking at the distribution, if that's how you're gonna differentiate them, then the Russian rat snake, the one that is the most common in captivity, occurs in Russia, obviously. Um, and that's in the Amal Basin and the Primorsky area um, from the Nomrog River. Um, the, uh, there's a, a mountain range in Mongolia, the far east. I think it was called Ikkyangen, but I can't pronounce it properly. The Khabarovsk region in eastern Russia. I'm probably butchering, butchering these words to the Usuri Basin in the Primorsky. That's the Russian range of the Russian rat snake. South throughout Korea, so North and South Korea, and then to the Northern parts of China. Uh, so I believe that the areas that they're found there would be Heilongjiang, which my wife actually has relatives there. So sooner or later, we're gonna get a chance to go there and look for the Claude Salamanders there and hopefully find Russian rats. Jilin and Liaoning, I think was the other place. Um, and the type specimen for Shrenkai was from the Hingan Mountains in Russia. The Korean rat snake occurs definitely China. That's, that's what we've got definite. So it's further south than the Russian rat snake. And that occurs in like the Chi Chinese provinces of Hebei, around Beijing, Shandong, Shaanxi, Jiangsu. I think Inner Mongolia, I think parts of Inner Mongolia. Um, ironically, we call it the Korean match rat snake, but its status in Korea, I don't even know if it occurs there. That's, you know, you, you need to look at, you know, taxonomy there. And the Thai specimen was taken from a place in China called Chifeng, which I've actually been to and I've found um, Korean rat snakes actually there. So, I mean, I, I'm sure I'll show you some pictures of, of some of the field collected ones I've, I've managed to fi find there. Um, I can tell you the Chinese names of both snakes, although again, I'm probably gonna butcher the pronunciation, although my wife was tutoring me beforehand. Uh, so the Russian rat snake was Zhonghei Jin Shu, which means the brown and black rat snake. And the Korean rat snake was the Chifeng Jin Shu, which is the Chifeng rat snake um, after the locality. And if you look at the literature, um, the, the Russians in particular have got a, a number of different names. So Amor rat snake after the Amor region, the Siberian rat snake, Manchurian rat snake after the Chinese region. The great black rat snake, because it can be quite black, Shrenk's rat snake, the black water snake. Um, and ironically, it has been referred to as the Korean rat snake. So that's the, uh, the first two. Um, and they're basically large, about two meter long rat snakes. The Korean rat, so the, the animal that's not necessarily found in Korea itself, but in China, but is called the Korean rat snake in a hobby. So a Laffey anomala. I'll refer to that as the Korean rat snake for the rest of the video, is basically brown. Um, although they can be quite pretty. I mean, I've seen some photos of one caught by Kevin Messenger um, 
who's a friend of mine who studies snakes in China, uh, went beautiful orangey yellow throat um, um, underside. Um, as they get older, as we said, they go through an ontogenetic change. So they start sort of like dark brown on buff in color. Um, now the, the Korean rat snakes, the anterior part of the body fades. So it can be almost plain light brown with a yellow underside. Uh, and then the posterior section of the body, the back part, retains the marking. So it's got the banding. The Russian rat, the one that we in the hobby are used to, what we call a Russian rat, which is this, basically, um, is a black or very dark brown snake with 20 or 30 light saddles that can be buff or, in the case of the nicer animals, some would say yellow. Uh, and you can get some really high yellow animals. I mean, this one has got quite bright yellow on it. Uh, which you can see, especially on the lips, and they've, they've got quite um, pronounced labial stripes, you know, that sort of black and yellow that gives them that mangrove snake appearance. Um, oh, and they're also found in the Netherlands. So there is a feral population of, I can't, you know, both species, I would say, or hybrids uh, in around the Eelder Airport, um, which has been there for a few decades now. And because they used to be considered the same species, Anomala and Shrenke were considered one, they were often sold as the same species. So I believe the animals there were mixed and have hybridized. And that's why if you look at the animals that you get there, you see some really weird patterns. I mean, I've seen some people catch them because, you know, they're, they're not native. So people are allowed to just catch them and take them rather than cull them. And they look like... Korean animals. They, they don't look like Russian rats. And then others look like Russian rats with almost reddish patches. So there's a, there's quite a variety. And, and some of the pictures I've been shown from the Korean peninsula have been almost patternless golden animals, which look really cool. Um, I think it was Kim Hyuntai that shared those with me, or Shin Yu Jil. Um, and those are the Russian rats. So genetically, those are Russian rat snakes. Um, again, I've got you know me. Um, so the other species that we'll talk about is Elaphe climacophora. And what I'll do is I'm going to put this one away and get that out. And that's the Japanese rat snake. It's got him in a chokehold at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the, the lovely thing about these animals is that they are really, really docile. And they, you know, you, you take them out and they just love to climb around on you. They just go straight up you. They're not scared at all. But they, they really like to do their own thing. Um, and just disinfect. As we say, always disinfect between the handling animals. All right. Now, I'm... Uh, Historically, getting out Japanese rat snakes is a bit of a different challenge to Russians. As Russians and Koreans tend to be very docile, the Japanese rats are very food-oriented. So I would actually say I've taken more bites from them than, than all other snakes combined. Ironically, ours at work made me bleed today. <laughs> Hello, are you going to bite me? Oh, you're in your moist height. Okay. There uh, you go. Well, he's actually... So this is actually quite a big old specimen. Um, one of the things I will, one of the things I'll go into is that these animals live a long time. Um, I've had some of these since, and I was actually looking up um, how long I've had some of them. 1994. So these animals are approaching 30 years old. Uh, some of them. How old uh, is that one? That this one. This one is an old animal, but I don't know how old. This one I actually got from a friend of mine, Dave Willis. I rehomed it. Um, it. It is quite an old animal. You can quite see it's old, old, actually. You can see the muscle, yeah, actually. It, you can see that it is. Well, it is. Remember, that I am cooling them because they're going to go into brumation. So they're not actually. Um, I've kept them lit today so I can. you can see me in the video. But actually, they, they are in the process of cooling as well. So, But yeah, this is, this is an old animal. About six feet as well. They don't always get six feet. I've got some that are quite old that are only five feet, so they seem to vary. But um, this is Elafe Klamakophora. It's uh, the Japanese rat. Uh, it was named by Boy in 1826, so it's, it's been known for a long time. 
The Japanese name is Aoi Daisho, which means the blue general, um, because they can be blue. And some of the animals I've got are blue, especially the Kunishir Island animals, which are the really sought after ones. You can see that, I mean, they're big, but they are more slender and longer than the Russians, almost more like Zamenis. So I actually find them very similar to the Escalapian snakes. When the Escalapians get bigger and they start putting a bit more girth on them as adults, I find them very similar to Russian rats. And they seem to have a very similar mode of life in that they, they both climb quite a lot. Um, if you see one of these, they're easy to dis to distinguish. Um, they've got a post-ocular streak. I don't know if you can see it well. This one's quite a dark animal. They've got those they've got, Alice Cooper eyes. Yeah, so they've got a post-ocular streak behind the eye. Um, there is an albino morph, and it's actually a naturally occurring morph, although I believe they're kind of like in semi-captivity at the moment, but we've known about them as far back as the 1700s. So I think the first record of a white, um, a shirohebi, a white snake, was 1726 from Japan. Um, but they were discovered most frequently in a place called the Iwakuni Prefecture in Japan. Um, now that region has become quite urbanized and the, um, that population is separated you know, by, by human influence and by mountains from the rest of the population. I believe that may be quite a factor in why they've got such a high incidence of the white specimens. And they were protected by the Japanese government in 1924. So they're actually considered a national treasure, the Shirohebi. Are they, are, have you seen images? Are they definitely albino? Or yeah, not? yeah, no, they're albino. I mean, uh, Charlotte Wilford here in the UK breeds them. And I actually saw a really nice baby uh, up when I went to see Chaz a couple of months ago. And I was, I was very tempted. I mean, I'm not really a fan of albinos. Um, but I've been keeping Japanese rats so long and like the albino Japanese rats, they are naturally occurring. I wouldn't mind having one just, you know, just to say, uh, cause it, they are quite beautiful. Um, I think if it was leucistic, I'd be all over it. No, these, this one, the one that I saw definitely had red eyes and the ones I've seen from Iwakuni have pink eyes, I believe. So I don't think they're leucistic. I think they're actually albino. Although as you know, morphs are not really my, uh, my strong suit. Um, but they are one of the largest snakes on Japan, definitely outside Okinawa, is said. On Okinawa, you've got beauty snakes, and I believe the um, Karinata as well, so they're quite big. Um, but they're pretty easy to distinguish. They are greyish, olive green, greenish. Um, the head is often grey, bluish sometimes. I mean, you know, the, the nicer animals can be quite blue. The juveniles also undergo a certain amount of ontogenetic change. They're blotched, although some can have stripes, and the stripes do last until adulthood. Um, and there are records of albinos from other places. So it's not just the Iwakuni. There's been some found in the 60s, I think, from Kanagawa and 77 in the Kanto region. And that isn't a Pokemon reference. <laughs> but basically, the, the Japanese rats are found on all four of the main Japanese islands. Um, and me being the completest I am, I'm going to try and remember them. I think it was Kyushu. Honshu, Hokkaido, and Shokaku. Uh, they're also found on some of the smaller islands like Yakushima, Tanegashima, and Tsushima. The Ryukyu Islands. Um, come on, Emily, that's impressive. <laughs> and of course, Kunashir Island, which is under Russian control since, you know, for the last few decades. Do you know what's funny? You say it's impressive, but because it's you, I expect it of you. <laughs> yeah, it's, I have a reputation to maintain. <laughs> <laughs> So are there localities of them then? Well, there are certainly colour forms. So you've got a striped form and you've got a blotched form. I don't know whether those are locality specific. The Kunashir Island animals are the sought after ones, which I've got some which I actually don't show very often anymore because every time I put pictures up, I get like a horde of people messaging me and PMing me if I want to sell them. Um, but they are nice enough that Sue Knight, who is the goddess of rat snakes. Like if you, if you know anything about rat snakes in the last few decades, Suzanne Knight is one of the mover and shakers in the UK. She's commented that they, that my ones were the nicest ones that she had ever seen. Um, so that's high praise for someone that's notorious for their preference of dull brown snakes. I don't think uh, you've ever shown me either. I, I'll, I'll send you pictures of them. They're, they're the ones with the sky blue heads. I, I, have, I mean, I, I have got pictures of them on my Facebook and Instagram. 
but they are they're generally like a, the ones I've got are a much lighter, brighter green, and the heads go sky blue during the breeding season, like bright blue, not just like a sort of dim bluish green. They they go bright blue. Um, a lot of the animals that get sold as Kunashir Island animals, I don't think are, or they've been hybridized with them, you know, with a normal locality to the point where you don't really see a difference. Uh, and I think that nowadays any super bright green animal is just called Kunashir local locality. Um, but that's a general description of the three species. Um, and they, they just make fantastic pets. I mean, you can see they're docile. You know, people talk about the Russian rats all day long, and they are, if you talk to anyone that keeps Russian rats, you will just, you get this sort of gushing about them. Everyone that, that keeps them just loves them because they've got personality. You know, they're alert, they're active. They will, they will investigate you. They're not scared. You know, uh, the, 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 the juveniles can be quite flighty, but the adults get really <sighs> majestic, shall we say, is one word. But you know what? The Japanese rats are the same. Um, the Japanese can be more food oriented, so you've got to be much more careful about getting them out of the viv. I think they'd be ideal candidates for some of the target training that Laurie Torini does. I think that would be fantastic to do with them because I'm not kidding. Some of the animals that I've got, they they will bite anything. Just it's not aggression. It's they will literally just think it's food. Um, I mean, I've got Charlie, so I think I'd be prepared for it. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're worse than kings, believe it or not. I mean, I've, I've kept lots of kings, as you know. These are worse because they actually are quicker and they will chase a lot more. Um, I mean, I've he got hasn't photos, met Charlie Ellie. <laughs> I, I've, I've got photos that have them swallowing fingers, you know, and they've actually swallowed the finger all the way up, you know, and they would have carried on if they could. So just be aware of that. They can be very food oriented, although not all are the same, um, but they're still very hardy and next to unkillable. Um, so these are snakes that are, if anything, hardier than things like corn snakes. Like they, they will take more than, than corn snakes. They, they're that hardy. I'm surprised someone hasn't taken them and bred them to blue up, blue up, blue up, blue up. No one's really done that, have they? Could happen. I mean, I know that there have been hybrids of Japanese and Russians. I've never seen one, but I know Scott Lupian had a picture of one. Uh, no, no, Scott Lupian had a hybrid Korean and Russian. Sorry. But there have been hybrids of Japanese and Russians, but I, I don't know what they would look like. It must be quite interesting. Um, but you'd think that people would sort of jump on the the, the Japanese rats. But, uh, I mean, I've been breeding them for years, and I actually stopped. It got to the point where I got shouted at recently, well, a few years back by somebody, because I said that I feed the eggs off to some of my other animals, like oligodon, skinks, coach whips. And they got really upset at that. I was like, but I've been breeding them for decades literally decades and nobody wants them you know like they're, they're just olive you know the babies are really squirmy thin olive colored animals and you know there's always one or two people with a bit of culture that like them but with a bit of culture yeah but other, normally it's like people say they want them and then they never actually uh you know who wants a great big five or six foot long olive brown animal now when you've got the really bright green ones and you know the uh, or the blue-headed ones, yeah. Then they're, they're nicer, but they're not all that. You know they can't compete even with the corn snakes. We say in terms of attraction, I think they're fantastic, but I can see why people would kind of sleep on them the same way that they do on Escalapian snakes, for example, which are similarly super easy to keep, super hardy, but very few people like. There, there's a niche for them, I suppose, but very few people in the main community are even aware of them, let alone keep them. Um, but you can see just how docile and calm they are. I mean, this, this is an old boy, but... I don't understand why someone hasn't taken, like, right, I'll get these greener, green and greener, I'll take this lot and make them bluer and bluer and bluer. Like, some people would, like, you think some people were, like, so into that sort of thing they would have jumped on that? It might have been done, and I just don't know about it. Remember that I, I don't really follow morph breeding. <laughs> so it's like I can tell you all about the taxonomy and the habits and natural history and how to keep them, but the, the moment somebody mentions a morph, I kind of turn off. So it's not that I've got anything against morphs. I'm just not interested in them. So it could just be that I haven't really processed when somebody has mentioned it. But Would I don't you consider know that a morph if it's not a gene? I don't it's, know. It's uh, not a Mendelian, isn't form. it? So. If it's a color form, then it's a, a morph, like you know, like the, the dark so. morph or the or the light morph. So it might not be genetic. Maybe somebody has already found that out. Um, 
The other thing I will say is that they change colour quite a lot as well, uh, which is something that I've been quite surprised by. So in over the winter, uh, they get really dark greyish, almost like sort of gunmetal grey. As they brumate, they get kind of dark. And then when they come out and they shed for the first time, they go from a really dingy brownish grey, they start lighting up and becoming green. They seem to brighten up under lights as well. Um, like mine go really green under UV. Few people have said this and a few people said they haven't noticed it but from what i can gather when they don't have lighting they tend to darken down and then when you expose them to lighting they brighten up quite a bit um and they're one of the few species of snake that i've seen this happen one is candoya the solomon island boas i've had those and they change color for sure i think with them it's more temperature related and then african platyceps the um platyceps florilentus in particular change color um some people, it's been written that it's substrate based, but I've had animals all kept the same and they've all gone from grey to one has gone bronze, one has gone black, one has stayed grey, one's got blotches. So there is, I don't know what triggers it, I can't say, but in the Japanese rats, it seems to be light that, that seems to make them brighten up. Uh, but, you know, that, that's not definite, that's just what I've observed anecdotally. Should we talk about the habits? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Let's go into that. Uh, I know. So, so Chaz was feeding back to me, and he said that uh, I should compartmentalize the uh, these talks a bit more because I, I tend to babble. Um, so, if we're looking at the habits, I mean, if we talk about the Russians and Koreans first, they're snakes of bright and sunny localities. What are you doing? <laughs> it's like burrowing into my finger. Um, they're usually found in mountainous areas, so over two hundred and fifty meters or so. And the Korean rats, at least one, have been found above 1,800 meters. So they can go quite high. Um, one thing I've noticed is that the ones I've seen have all been near water. Um, and I found Korean rat snakes in the Labaguman primeval forest in China, which is a, like one of the largest birch forests in Asia. I found them on the outskirts of Jinan. I know for a fact that you get them around Champing, uh, as I was sent a photo of one there. And I know for a fact that they occur in the Emperor's Summer Palace in Beijing because, again, a friend of mine took a, po a picture of one and it was swimming, incidentally. So they seem to be tied to water or, you know, they're not water snakes, let's, let's get that clear. They don't need like a semi-aquatic enclosure, but they seem to be, like the habitats they tend to go for seem to usually be near water. Also coniferous woodlands, um, mixed forests. Um, they will colonize agricultural land quite readily, so they're... they're they can tolerate anthropogenic anthropogenic um, change quite well to the point that I know that in Korea, they are considered like household spirits and are treated with reverence. Uh, so they're allowed in the houses in some areas there. Um, and I found them uh, Pan Long Shang, which is an area uh, to the northeast of Beijing near Miyun. I found them there around uh, bird cages where ducks were being bred. Um, and the Russian rats, I've definitely seen videos of them being found on quite grassy meadows as well. So these are animals that are basically diurnal. They inhabit areas that get really cold. So, I mean, Beijing can get minus 10 in the winter. Um, I mean, it, it, it's cold enough that when my mother-in-law comes to stay with us in England in the winter, she thinks that it's a summer holiday uh, in the winter. So she says, because the air is so nice and can't cool, and it's like, but it's near freezing. It's, it's like, you know, five degrees, four degrees. And for someone that's not used to maybe a place like Canada or continental Russia or Asia, that it gets really cold, I guess we'll never understand what it's really like when it gets really, really cold. But it, it, it gets cold enough in the winter that these areas get well below freezing. And these are animals that survive that. So in terms of hardiness, along with Dion, Zilafidion, the Russian rats in particular are easily one of the most temperature tolerant and hardiest reptiles that you're going to keep in the hobby that, you know, that are commonly kept. The only challenges there would be the black or gray rat snakes that are found in Canada, which I imagine have fairly similar climatic conditions in terms of temperature drops. Perhaps the northernmost garter snake subspecies, you know, they live in fairly cold uh, regions around like Manitoba and all that, Ontario. But other than that, like Korean, uh, rather Russian and Dion's rat snakes can take a lot of, of 
cold temperatures. And then in the summer, the temperature rises to more like continental Europe. Um, there does seem to be a difference in habitat preference between males and females as well. Um, so males prefer more vegetated sites uh, with like area with high vegetation cover, such as grasslands, rock piles, human houses. The females that are non-breeding seem to prefer to stay closer to water. And the females that are breeding tend to stay closer to roads, sadly, which is why they get run over a lot, because they warm themselves stigmatically on the road, you know, on the, on the asphalt. Uh, if we talk about these guys, the Japanese rats, broadly similar. Uh, again, we're talking semi-arboreal habitat generalists that move around a lot by day, so they're mainly diurnal. Um, again, they can withstand anthropogenic change very well, and we know this because there are lots of videos of these animals in very urbanized areas. I mean, I'm on maybe a dozen snake identification groups online, and I see Japanese rat snakes a lot. You know, they, they, most weeks I see a couple of Japanese rats. There was a lovely viral video that went around earlier this year of one found, I think it was around Tokyo, and it was on one of the trees full of cherry blossoms where the public had gone for a cherry blossom viewing, and the snake was just, like, on the tree, and everyone was... <laughs> You know, just taking the, the, the film of the uh, the Japanese rat climbing. And that actually gave me a nice idea for a cherry blossom themed enclosure. Um, when I move house, that's something that I'd like to uh, sort out. When it comes to food, all three species tend to be warm blooded prey specialists. So the Korean and Russian rats prefer rodents, birds, and their eggs. Uh, like one of their main prey I know is the tree sparrows and house sparrows that you get in uh, China. Passa monticula is, is the species, exact, and their eggs. And that is one of the, the primary prey species. And then also rodents. So anything up to the size of a rat, um, the squirrels, voles, obviously. There are, there, I mean, there are, there's a multitude of small rodents out there. I mean, you can see them. I have seen at least one video of an adult uh, Russian rat snake eating or subduing, which is impressive as a, a Siberian weasel, which is one of those bright yellow weasels that you sometimes see in the parks in Beijing. I've seen a video of one actually killing one of those, which was, it was hard to watch because it was very loud. Like the weasel went down, with, didn't go down without a big fight. And the animal that was, the snake was really scarred. So you could see this was an animal that was used to taking a beating. So they'll take, you know, relatively large mammals, although I find in captivity they seem to prefer slightly smaller prey. Um, I've also seen some videos of both species, so Korean and Japanese rats, eating the local blue or Asia-winged magpies, um, which are the magpies that you get in China. So you get the normal magpie, the black and white one, but just as common, you've got this beautiful blue-winged magpie which used to be lumped in together with the blue-winged magpies that you find in Spain that I used to see growing up, but they're a different species now. Um, and I've seen them raiding the nests of those. And all three species, so much like most of the rat snakes, although they're called rat snakes, they have adaptations to egg-eating. Um, so the, the one that has the, the most adaptation are the Japanese rats, and I think they've got what are known as vertebral hypapophases, which are hypapophyses, they're basically uh, bony protrusions on the underside of their vertebrae that become sickle-shaped the further back that they go. Similar to the egg-eating snakes, you know, um, Dacipeltis, not quite as adapt, you know, not quite as derived. And they use those to break the eggs. And in the Japanese rat, they go from the eighth to the 49th vertebra. And in the Korean and Russian rats, they go from the eighth to the 45th vertebra. Um, and so they're obviously fairly well adapted to taking eggs as well as rodents. I have had several accounts that say that they won't take frogs. So uh, there was a, a very old Japanese account by a zookeeper called Ryota Tatsuki. Um, and he was keeping Russian rats, um, Ukotokus rufa dosatus, which I've got here as well, which are the red bat rat snakes, which are found in China and Korea, and Rhabdophis tigrinus, which are the, the um, tiger keelbacks, which are another common species that you get in the same habitat. Now, those three species you get in the Primorsky, they, they occur in the same habitat. And there is a, a Russian YouTube channel that actually films them along with the local Gloidius that I follow 
and I love watching his videos because they show really nice, nice in-depth photography of the species in the wild. Now, they used to introduce uh, three species of amphibian into that enclosure with the Russian rats, redback rats, and um, tiger heelbacks, and they were the Asian toads, Bufo gargarizans, the oriental firebellies, which are the Bombina orientalis, and the local black-spotted frogs, which were uh, Pelophylax nigromaculatus. Uh, have you just gone to sleep here, have you? <laughs> um, and of the three species, the Russian rats didn't even... They, they used to investigate them, but they never went for them. So the Russian and Koreans seem not to be interested in cold-blooded prey, at least as adults. Would the juveniles go for them? I can't say. So I'm not saying that you should ever cohabit them with frogs or lizards, but they seem to be specialists in warm-blooded prey. And there have been comparisons in prey handling between this species, Clamacophora, and another Japanese species, Quadrivigata, Elaphid Quadrivigata, which is more of a frog and toad eater. The Japanese, these Japanese rats, that is the, the, the Climacophora, were far more um, well-equipped to deal with rodents and learned far more quickly and subdued them over time much better than the Quadrivigata, which were seemed to be more generalists. Um, on that note, I will also say that I keep, the Russians with Turkish geckos. Uh, I tried this experiment a few years ago as I've got, I had an outbreak of those little annoying fungus gnats in a couple of my vids and my wife was getting annoyed. So I thought, well, I'm going to try uh, putting pairs of these geckos. I've got so many of the Turkish geckos, they just breed um, and see what happens. And I wasn't sure, what, I didn't know what was going to happen. I wasn't sure whether the snakes were eating. The, the rat snakes are much, much bigger. I mean, the geckos are three inches long. The snakes are seven feet long. Um, so it wouldn't be a meal for them. And when I first introduced them, I got a bit panicky because the actual adult snakes used to follow the, the trail of the geckos really intently. Like really, you know, it was a novel scent for them and they used to follow them along the branches and look, but they never ate them. They just sit down. And I've actually got photos and seen the geckos sitting on top of the snakes basking. So the adults at least don't seem to go for lizards. Juveniles, probably, maybe. I mean, if you look at their range, I don't think there are many lizards in the Russian range. I mean, you probably get Zootoka, the, uh, the viperous lizards, might get, um, I think there might be a species of Tachydromus or two in northern China. Uh, there's lots of frogs, but there doesn't seem to be any kind of literature detailing cold-blooded prey being consumed by Shrenki or Anomala. So these... They're fairly stenophagous. They, they, they go for warm-blooded prey. The Climacophora, I, I would doubt that the, the juveniles don't go for small frogs. I bet they would, because they, they just tend to eat anything, including fingers. But the adults certainly, again, are warm-blooded prey specialists. Um, so that's basically an overview of the natural history of these. I'm going to put this fellow back, and I'll get out a Korean rat. Did you look up a picture of the um, white um, Japanese rat snakes? I haven't yet, no. Looks amazing. Do they really? I'm sure if you speak yeah. to Chaz, Chaz had one recently. I, I nearly bought it. It was only about 70 or 80 quid, which was a bargain as far as I'm concerned. And the only reason I didn't buy it was that I came back with three other snakes that trip. I, I went to sell babies and I came back with a few. <laughs> Which just always happens when you go and see when you go to snakes and adders because they've just got such nice collection of clubins. So it's like it's like mecca for me. Right, let me. Open. It's painful going to snakes and adders. It's literally like taking an alcoholic into like a bar. It's just not a good idea. Yeah, especially when he's putting them in your hand. Yeah, <laughs> like, hold that. And like, oh no. Yeah, he's quite sly like that. It's just like <laughs> I don't think he knows what I'm gonna like as well. Yeah, that's how we like got us to get those Calabar wyverns by like putting it in your hand like oh, why have you done this to us I remember we went to we went to the show with Donnie and you were literally in the hotel like I can't stop thinking about them wyverns <laughs> yeah I mean to be honest I saw I think they were Anterasia perthensis the anthill pythons mm. um, or no not anthills but the, the perthensis and you know me, I like my small, dull brown snakes. Um, I'm a colubrid guy myself. I've, I actually have an Antaragio back there that was gifted to me by a friend, Teddy Simler. Um, and I really like them. Um, 
and these pathenses are gorgeous, like sort of brick red. And it was the same thing. It was like, wow, those are really nice. <laughs> I think they're um, kind of colubid-like as well, aren't they? They, they are, yeah. The anteraja seems to be quite colubid-like. I find them very colubid because most of my other snake handling has been pythons and they're not like them at all, which is nice. It's different. This is a Korean rat. It's a, bit, it's a small one. Uh, the adults are at my mum's house at the moment. I keep this one here. This one I actually kind of got by chance. Uh, there was a shop that advertised it as an elaphic cantoris, cantor's trinket snake. And I saw that and I was like, <gasps> what? You know, <laughs> that's a species that we never see in captivity. Um, so I had a look at it. I was like, that's not cantoris, that's um, anomala, but I'll have it. <laughs> it's like, I, I want more. These are a bit rarer than um, the Russians. At least I'm sure that what we have has been hybridized as well. So I'm sure there's probably anomala DNA somewhere you know, in the genes of the captive population and vice versa. I'm sure there's probably Schrenker DNA in, it, in a lot of the captive population. I know that for a long period, it was hard to find normal anomala like this. So if you look, you can, I mean, it's a bit dark, but it's got a lovely yellowy brown sort of buff front. Faint blonde looking. almost. And then the further back you get, it's got those almost like the juvenile Schrenke pattern. So but it's more yellow. It's actually a really handsome animal. Um, I'm quite enamored of it. Um, now, there was a, a time, maybe 10 years ago, which was the last time I actually saw Anomala for sale, where all you could find were the albino Anomala. Um, and I know that, that those are about now as common as the normal colors, if not more so. The only breeder that I know really that that regularly breeds that i know of is a guy in canada that was named vanan kesavan i think and he sent me some pictures of both the the albino and the normal colors um and i know that he he's got some nice animals there um now i, I did say that there were behavioral differences that made that lead me to believe that this is not the same species as shrenke for one thing they seem to prefer slightly higher temperatures or rather they don't tolerate quite as low temperatures which makes sense this is an animal that gets down to central china uh sing tao for example um where it's not as cold as obviously Siberia, you know russia amal basin um the animals that i've seen have to say the wild ones were really docile though i just picked them up and they were just as tame as the, the ones that i've just been holding they just let me do what i want with them i'll send you pictures of those but I've met some in captivity, and the, the others that I've got are more flighty. They don't act the same as the Russians. They are a bit more shy, and they prefer it slightly warmer, I think. Uh, that's my experience with them anyway, that they seem to prefer slightly warmer temperatures, maybe slightly more humid as well. Uh, but otherwise, the, the husband is the same. But the behavior isn't exactly the same, uh, in my opinion. So that's one factor that leads me to believe that they are a separate species. Um, so, should we talk about um, husbandry, housing? Yes, definitely. I mean, that's the. I think that's what everyone really wants to hear, rather than me waffling on about like, Latin names and all that. <laughs> so, the, this is my experience, you know, and, and as always, I have my own very strong opinions. Then others may not agree, but these are diurnal, active, semi-arboreal snakes that experience drastic changes in temperature, humidity, and daylight. They are hardy enough that you could probably keep them just like any other snake, and they probably would survive. I'm not going to deny that. People have been keeping them in racks and tubs. But to my, in my opinion, if you've got a six-foot adult of an active snake like this, the... How do I put this delicately? If you're looking at absolute minimum size enclosure... I would say a four by two by two isn't enough for them, but I wouldn't judge somebody keeping one in a four by two by two. I think that a six by two by two is better. And I think, I think a six by two by three high is better still. Um, that's for the Russians and the Koreans, an adult. Obviously, the, you know, this is a smaller specimen, about three and a half to four feet, so I keep this one in a four feet. The adults I keep in six feet. Um, the biggest adults I keep in six by three by threes. And like, I, if I, if I had space, I would give them more. I think these are animals that 
there is no upper size limit to what you keep them in as adults. I know keepers in mainland Europe, in the Netherlands and Germany, that keep them outdoors. Um, and these are like the Russians. He sent me a video because he's got thermometers in the actual outdoor enclosure. And they're active at like 12 degrees. It's, it's, it's insane. Like they're active at normal autumn day in, in the UK temperatures. They're out basking. So they are hardy animals. Now, they don't like too much heat. That's the other thing. Um, the Russian rat snakes tolerate it a bit more, but even with them, I find that they tend to escape when it gets too high. So the kind of heating that you use is important to see these act out. Otherwise, if you overheat them, what you're going to see is they're going to curl up against the cool side of the enclosure or in the water bowl, and that's all they're going to do. And that is a shame because, you know, they would do more. They're active animals. So once you've got the size of the enclosure sorted out, now you can argue how many angels dance on the head of the pin. Is it a four by two, a six by two, a six by three? When I, when, you know, I prefer animals to be kept, the snakes to be kept in an enclosure at least as long as the animal is. But, you know, if you don't do that, the perimeter, you know, half the perimeter of the enclosure being as long as the animal, I think that's fair. I wouldn't judge it, you know, if the length plus the width is the length of the snake. I think nowadays in the UK, we're getting, you know, slowly but surely we're moving towards upper size limits. And I've got to be honest, these are the kind of snakes that you want larger enclosures for. Uh, if you want them to display the activity, the curiosity that they can, it would be a shame to put this into a tub. You know, others can argue that's down to them. But this is my opinion. I mean, I've had my animals, some of them from 1994. I've bred multiple generations of them. I've experienced the three species. So Climacophora and Schrenke I've had from the 90s. I've got animals here that are 30 years old. Uh, the first anomaly I got was in 2011 from Crystal Palace Reptiles. Um, but, you know, I say that as if it's yesterday, and that was 11 years ago. You know, it just, it feels like yesterday, but, you know, it just, the time goes so quick. So these are not, these are animals I've got a fair amount of time racked up with. And, you know, I'm, there are other, I'm sure there are people that have even more. But from my observations, my anecdotes, these are animals that first of all need space. Um, and I would say the same for beauty snakes as well, Carinata. Um, you know, Carinata, I find them more shy, so they don't display as well, but certainly beauty snakes always up and about the same as these the next is heating now heating can be a problem as i said because when you're heating and I, the, so let's say you've got the animal in the primorse gate the average day temperature might be 15 degrees you know the ambient but the animal in a well insulated site isn't at 15 degrees the sun is shining down on that and is warming that to maybe 25 or 30 degrees if you measure the surface temperature on there, it's warmer than the ambient. So that's where it can be misleading. So some people I know keep them at room temperature. I am sure they would survive that, but they would prefer a bit warmer. Uh, let me hold this up a bit more. You can see how docile they are. They just kind of like rest on your hands. Um, so the way I heat is with halogens. Um, CHEs are the least... Um, effective for these because the CHE ceramic heat emitters are going to warm up the air temperature and you don't want that. You want the ambient temperature within the enclosure. I maintain it at room temperature because my enclosures are quite large. So 20, 22 degrees, the same temperature as the room around them, that's fine. When you look at how warm it is in their environment, that's actually warmer than it might be in their environment. But they would have a localized basking area. They would find areas of warm stone roads, whatever, and they would warm themselves there, or they'd warm themselves in the sun. Heat mats could work, and with many of my animals, I, I do use very low wattage small heat mats as supplemental heat, which is great. You know, it gives them a supplemental heat, especially once you switch the halogens off, you can leave the heat mats on for a few hours at night, and that gives them something to bask on, just as they would on a road. And, you know, as I said, we know that they, they use asphalt to bask in Korea. Halogens and this again comes down to the type of heat that come down, are great because they provide a localized basking area. Uh, basking area. You've got the halogen above, 
and you know you'll have covered this in far more detail than I'm about to, but the the near infrared, the infrared A heat warms and penetrates the flesh of the animal more effectively without warming the air around it as drastically as the CHE. So you get to maintain a great thermal gradient between a decent basking area, 25 to, to 30 degrees is fine for them. Not, you know, not you don't need higher. Um, whereas the ambience can stay around 20 or 22, you know, you don't really want things to be getting higher than 24. Um, with the Climacophora, they'll take it a bit higher. They're, they're, they're happier higher, but even then you might find that they try and escape into a water bowl um, if, you, if you put them over 25, the ambience. So I find that they like about room temperature and then they'll just go and bask when they want to. So you want a localized heat source. Um, I'm just looking at the enclosures to, to, to get an idea of what to tell you next. So the formula that one uses for keeping snakes, and you know, I'm going to be honest, keeping snakes is not difficult. You keep them all more or less the same way, and the animals are quite easy organisms to keep alive. They're, as far as I'm concerned, snakes are extremely well suited to captivity. There are there are you know higher and lower standards of welfare, but snakes are easy and hardy. And we, could, we know this because they've been bred for generations. These species have been, you know, known for years. I mean, I remember, and the reason I know that I've been keeping uh, the Climacophora and the Shrenka since 94 is that I remember there was an article by a lad called James Coppen um, in Reptilian, the magazine Reptilian. I think it was volume three, one of the volume three issues from that year. And I actually went and found the, the year that volume came out because I had the animals at that time. And because I remember getting that volume because it had an article on the the rats it was a guide to the rat snakes it was a multi-volume article and i remember um just being happy to see anything any literature about those species because i already had some by then so you've got heat sorry up next is light now they're diurnal snakes i'm not going to say that they're going to drop dead without light you know do they need light well no they don't need it you can keep them without it they certainly prefer light the climacophora will color up with light the animals like and will expose themselves to uv uh, so i certainly would strongly advocate uh, providing uv for them it doesn't need to be high level uv index one to two is absolutely fine um they are drawn to light they are diurnal and i and the way i know this is because um, in my other house, the, the way that the enclosures are spaced, light comes in through a window onto one side, creating like a chink of bright light. And it's the side across from the heater and the UV light. You know, it's, it's a six foot space. Um, and the animals, when that light comes through in the evening, they will move into that and they, they seek that area out. So something about that wavelength attracts them. Now, it's not UV because UV doesn't penetrate glass and you've got the window and the viv glass in between it. So, But something, something on that spectrum seems to attract them and they will move into it. Uh, I have a friend called Charlotte on Facebook. Can't remember her last name, but she was at the first AHH meeting who also has Russian rat snakes. And she shared a photo of her animals doing exactly the same thing. And I got all excited. I was like, oh, mine do that too. Um, I'll try and find the photo to share with you. Um, so if glass filters out UVB and UVA, so it can only be either infrared or visible light that attracts them then technically in that scenario. Something in that wavelength of visible light, I don't know whether it's UVA or whether it's um, the wavelength in between UVA, that, that, that's for people like Roman or um, mm. Joe to figure out, but something about that light wavelength seems to attract them because they go crazy for it. Um, and they already have UV and halogens in there so they're not wanting for light um so lighting if you're going to give them lighting give them some bright light because they are day active animals give them some uv you know uv index one it doesn't have to be too high a shade dweller for example might work fine if, if they can get you know around the, the region 45 centimeters away from it um arcadia t5s are great as well as that's what i use in the larger enclosures um, but I would recommend UV. And if you provide them that, you will see them basking under it. That's, you know, if that's something to vary up their day, then that's good as far as I'm concerned. Regardless, you know, forget the health benefits and the stress relief it might provide them.
we, you know, we've, we've covered that in another video. So heat and light, those are the two of the three main gradients that you, you provide to all snakes. The third gradient is humidity. These are animals, you know, these are animals that are from environments where it can get quite humid, but they're not semi-aquatic. So what I've started doing in the last 10 years or so is I provide all my snakes with a, uh, a humid hide. It can be a moss box or it can be a curved shaped cork bark, which has got uh, sphagnum packed underneath it. And you lift up the bark and you spray it with water as required to keep it humid. Since I started doing that, and I do that with every snake, including the desert snakes, coach whips. I do that with spilotes. I do it with thrasops. I do it with all the rat snakes, everything, hog noses. I have not experienced a single bad shed. They're just shed full. Um, so that for me is, you know, they, they don't all use it with the same frequency. Some use it more than others. I do find that the Korean rats like it. The Russian rats are more prone to just curling up in their water bowl sometimes. Um, so I provide them tubs as water bowls. So, you know, just really useful boxes. Mm -hmm. Just a big one of those is a, is a great water bowl for a larger rat snake. If it's big enough for them to curl up in, then that's enough. I mean, it would be lovely if we had a room size enclosure with a pond for them to swim in, but you know, we're just normal keepers. We don't have that, you know, but if you can provide them a water bowl that it can curl up in, I think that's something that all snakes should have personally. Um, you know, there are some people that say that desert animals don't require it, rosy boas, transpicos, and that even having a water bowl will raise the humidity up to dangerous levels, to which I say your ventilation is not good enough. You know, if 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 a water bowl is going to kill off your snake with, a, you know, with humidity, then your ventilation needs looking at. It's not the water bowl. Um, but anyway, that, that's a different topic at hand. Um, so the three gradients for keeping snakes. Light, heat, humidity. You've covered viv size. Um, hides. So obviously, all snakes are secretive to an extent. Just because you're providing light and because they will spend some of their time under light doesn't mean that they won't spend the rest of their time hidden. And I would say if you're providing bright light, then it's all the more important to provide areas of absolute darkness as well. That's the, the dichotomy. Snakes are secretive animals, and there are times where they just don't want to be seen. So... You're going to want to provide a a series of hides. So, I mean, like one of these enclosures I'm looking at, I've got a long log that goes across the enclosure. And normally when they're hidden, they go under that because it, it goes from the warm end all the way to the cool end. Uh, but I also provide hidden. So what I'd like to do is I bury pieces of cork bark in the substrate. And then the sub you can't see them. But if you leave the entrance open, they will use that sometimes. Um, the substrate itself is... I find important for security of the animals. I'm very much an advocate of diggable substrate, substrate that they can actually dig around in. For one thing, they seem to like digging. I mean, you know, like snakes, you know, even flying snakes that I've got will dig occasionally. And these are like sort of hyper arboreal animals, but they will come down and dig quite a lot. Um, but rat snakes, like Dion's do it a lot, um, seem to like to dig burrows. And over a period of time, they'll dig like a lattice work of little burrows in the substrate. And when they decide to go in it, it's like whack-a-mole. They, they start coming out from one and then they go back in, they come out from another and you never know where they're going to pop out from because they've got this kind of little labyrinth of uh, of burrows in, their, you know, in the substrate that they can pop in and out of. Um, With your, obviously you're talking about having low air temperatures and you're using halogens. Are you controlling what temperature these halogens get into or are you using just really low wattage halogens and just letting them go if i use 20 watt halogens um in the larger enclosures i would sooner use two or three 20 watt halogens on a stat than a higher wattage halogen and that's for two region reasons one it provides a wider basking area now you've got to remember that these can be quite large animals you know it's like a seven foot snake if it curls up it might not be able to get its entire body under a just 120 watt halogen. So I hang the, you know, those little uh, reflectors, domes, and I put like multiple ones in there. Um, the other reason is that the 20 watt halogen still provides more gentle heat than say a 50 watt or a hundred watt. So I'd rather provide a wider, more gentle basking zone than one focused, you know, kind of like hyper-focused hot area that one bulb would provide. That's, that's just how I prefer to do it. 
it is, well, I don't know. I mean, I was going to say that it's more expensive and it certainly is in terms of bulb because the bulbs don't last all that long. They last a few months and then, you know, I think there's only a few thousand hours they last. Um, but in terms of cost, if you look, the electricity bill isn't that high. If you've got a 100 watt bulb versus three 20 watt bulbs, even there, I, don't, I think you'll be saving money. And I've, I have commented before that in this electricity crisis, I haven't really noticed much of an issue with bills. You know, obviously it's, it's expensive to run this many enclosures at anyway, but it hasn't really hit me that hard, I would say. And that Relative to your previous costs, you mean? Yeah, it, it probably sounds insufferable because I know that people are suffering with the, uh, the rate, the rises in costs. But again, this is another benefit of keeping mostly temperate species. I don't keep many tropical species anymore. Um, so you heat them by day and then they don't need heat at night. Um, and I just use 20 watt bulbs in the four foot vids, 30, you know, some of the, like the coach whips and the whip snakes require slightly higher heating, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's not super expensive. I find, um, I like to do it with gentle heat in a big enclosure because yeah, you've got this side, you know, a third of the enclosure is warmer now. And then the rest of the enclosure, if they want to move off, as long as it's well ventilated, they can move out and it's, you know, it's not too hot for them. Um, Are you, you still can... using reptile branded ceramic fittings or using like generic ceramic fittings for these? They are reptile branded. Yeah. I like the Arcadia fittings for single bulbs and for multiple bulbs. I don't know. I'll, I'll have to find, wait, actually, I think I've got one up there. The box. They're, they're kind of like cheap uh, reptile zoo mini combo like hoods. So they're like the two like bell shaped hoods and you can hang them. They've got a thing to hanging. And I use like for the coat trips, I've got four. So for example, so I've got like four bulbs in with those. The other rats might have two or three, you know, like a, an Arcadia with the with the two. And I just find that is better, for, you know, it's better for me. It's overdoing it. Obviously you're buying more equipment. I'm not going to lie. It is, you know, it's not the most efficient way of doing it. But I know what I'm attempting to achieve, with, you know, with the habitat. So I do what I can to achieve that rather than worry too much about the the costs too much, you know. So is that the domes literally within the 4 by 2 by 2 or whatever size it is? So that the so six, they can, yeah, those are the, the bigger ones. So the snakes can technically climb on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they can climb on them. But it's a 20-watt halogen. So if you touched a 20-watt ceramic, you burn yourself. And I've done that. Like you don't – any ceramic, you cannot touch. A 20-watt halogen, you burn yourself if you touch right on the – the front but if it doesn't dome you won't and colubrids they're not really as dumb as some of the larger pythons are either so you know i've seen where they will sort of look up and investigate it and tongue flick and then they won't get close to the to the light you know they, they don't seem to be so stupid that they'll ram their face into the bell to actually uh touch light but some of these bells have got like mesh across them anyway so um you, you've got to tailor it to the animal um, I've seen smaller colubrids kill themselves. Like I've, I've had friends um, show me pictures of colubrids that have killed themselves on mesh. They've got stuck in the mesh that was ostensibly to, to prevent them from getting to the heat source. So I can be a bit distrusting of that. I prefer not to have too much of that if I can. And I'd rather have a heating apparatus that isn't going to burn the animal on touch. I've been of the same opinion. Like, um, Especially this, is, this is stuff. my opinion. I'm sure there are people that will argue this. You know, yeah, I mean, I've been off the same. I mean, like you, people will argue because remember there was that there was that some reptile Instagram earlier that absolutely started dragging, dragging reptiles and research because of some like enclosure review I did where I didn't pick up on like an un unguarded like did the same situation you were doing. It was a very European setup where it was like yeah. a low halogen, yeah. low wattage halogen. Well, halogen. Like, dome. If you hold your finger on it, it might, it might burn you, of course. It gets hot, but it's not so hot that it's going to instantly cause damage. You know, and exactly, the animals yeah. are not that stupid that they'll just push their face in, because the only way they can get to them in the, in the bulbs, in the domes, is to shove their face into it. And they're not that stupid that they're just going to push their face into the hot thing. So Yeah, I mean, people get really passionate about it. I mean, I, there was a whole tirade about that. But, I mean, if it doesn't burn itself, it doesn't burn itself. <laughs> this is the difference between a 20-watt heat source, though, and a... 50 watt or a hundred watt or a 200 watt and some of the ceramic heat sources i've seen people recommend have been I, I 
it was only a year ago, so somebody was asking, what heat source do I use for a three-foot lift? Oh, a 250-watt uh, ceramic. <laughs> what? 250-watt ceramic for a three-foot lift? And what happens if your stat fails? Because you're relying on the stat not failing or somebody not accidentally knocking the stat out or, you know, something happening or the stat being faulty. What happens if that, ha if, you know, if that starts heating the viv at full heat? Well, heat will kill the animal much quicker than anything else. It will kill it quicker than cold. It will quicker, kill it quicker than too much UV. You know, heat is the most dangerous sort of force that you're introducing to these animals. That's why we have stats in the first place. But if the stat malfunctions and you've got a piece of equipment that's so much more powerful than you need it to be, that's that's like freakishly dangerous. I mean, it you know, I've had people criticize me for saying that I use no stat with a 20 watt bulb in large enclosures. It's like, well, I'm not saying don't use stats, you should, you know, especially if you're a beginner, but the stat is to regulate the temperature. If the piece of equipment is too is, is not powerful enough to overheat the enclosure if it's impossible for it to overheat it then what's a stat for exactly i mean this behind me literally doesn't have a stat on it you know so yeah i, I don't say it you know out and out to most people because you've got to be you know it's it's, it's social media you've got to be careful what you say you say i have a 20 20 watt bulb in an eight foot viv and I don't need a stat because it can't overheat that. And somebody will interpret that as not needing a stat for a hundred watt ceramic in a two foot viv. So it's like, you know, people, there's always going to be that hear they want to hear, person yeah. that will, that will fuck up somehow. So I do recommend stats. Definitely. Um, they're not always necessary, but it's exceptional circumstances for species that don't require constantly, you know, constant temperatures and all that. And a stat is useful as well for regulating and maintaining the correct temperature. It's just that in the very large enclosures, the very low wattage bulbs cannot overheat them. So, you know, for some species, that's fine. That's that's what I... I think it's probably better to have the probe on the cool end. You have the probe at the cool end and you start at the, like, highest acceptable cool end temperature you want to. And then it's, like, measuring a safe cool area escape from the heat. And then the heat can be on, like, if it's low enough wattage to max out at that basking spot, you leave that going at full power and it only ever dims it if it gets too hot in the entire vivarium. But I wouldn't recommend that to just anyone because people... No, yeah, it's not the sort of thing that I would ever post online without context or talk about in a video. It's it's what I do with specific mm -hmm. animals and habitat types. Now, the animals we're discussing don't require constantly high temperatures. Um, in fact, it would actually be worse for them to have a constantly high temperature. Um, they want localized basking sources, so they do need some heat. There are some people that erroneously think that they don't need any heat because they come from cold climates. No, they find heat. Um, but you don't have to heat the whole viv. That's the great thing about it. You can heat a small area of the viv and the rest of the viv will be room temperature, and they're fine with that. Um, these are animals that are found out, you know, I've, I've actually found like um, climatic data for Japanese rat snakes, which of the three are the ones that prefer heat the most. And, you know, that's not saying that they like too much heat, but they come from maybe the warmest, one of the warmer area, especially in the Rukyu archipelago. Their like, preferred ambient temperatures are between 15 and 24 degrees. 15. Now, I live in, the, in London. Um, even in the winter, with no heating, it doesn't get below about, it doesn't get to 15 in here. Um, so even in the middle of the winter my house is always as warm as, as it would be in these animals active periods so you know we'll we'll, we'll talk about brumation as well because that's an important aspect of their husbandry but people they get so used to dealing with tropical species like a royal python of course royal pythons need quite constant temperatures um at night as well but these are not subtropical animals these are temperate animals that come from really cool you know they're the hardiest Reptiles that you can pretty much find commonly in the pet hobby. Um, even room temperature will be fine for them. Um, to the point that, yeah, there are people that keep them with no heat. I don't agree with it. And they certainly like basking, but they'll survive at 20 degrees. Um, I don't think that they would necessarily survive well. Um, but, you know, they should be allowed to thermoregulate, but it doesn't need to be 
drastic and it can be turned off at night, which is a great thing for energy efficiency, which is quite an important thing in these in these uh, dark times. I think given the current crisis, a lot of temperate species will be much more um, enticing to a lot of keepers. It's one of the major reasons that I mainly keep temperate species now. It's, you know, um, If you've got a room full of animals and they're all tropical, then the room is likely to be like 30 degrees at, at night. Who wants to be in that room? It's, it's suffocating. So whereas temperate animals, yeah, you can heat them all separately. And yeah, it does get hot during the summer especially and you have to turn everything off but both me and just smiling at each other because both <laughs> our rooms get unbearable <laughs> yeah I, I, i've been there i know exactly how it is and i don't like it so it's a i like temperate species because you can switch the, the the everything off at night um and i've steadily moved as i've said before i've moved over the last decades to temperate species oh, i get a lot of tropical species too let's see what a few but i will always prefer temperate just so let's go into brumation then. Obviously, it's kind of irrelevant if you have to actually use electricity to like cool things down. So there's not necessarily cheaper, I suppose. But if you want something that gets below ten or whatever, you're gonna have to like refrigerate it somehow, aren't you? And all three of these species need cool brumation. Um, now, you're always gonna hear about the odd person who says that they've bred them without brumating. I'm sure I've done it, you know, but I have noticed lower fertility, especially with Russian rat snakes. Now, if you're looking at the winter temperatures in the Primorsky, we're talking about minus 15 sometimes. And these are reptiles that survive that. Now, it won't be minus 15 in the high vernacular. This is one of the, another of the pitfalls of relying on ambient temperature data from recording stations six feet above the ground. When they're going into crevices, those crevices do insulate, so it won't be quite that cold. But nevertheless, these are animals that will remain active even at two degrees. So I've actually looked in the fridge and... Everything else is asleep, and the Natrix and the Shrenky are literally just out and about moving. And it's like, why are you not sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> so do you have a dedicated refrigerator for... I've got several, actually. I've, I've got two dedicated refrigerators, and then the larger animals, so the king rats, the the, the big Russians, and so on. I've, I don't have a refrigerator big enough for those, because, you know, they're like six, seven feet long. They're going to need a 85-litre tub, you know, to spend the winter. So what I do with those is that I put those in the shed. Uh -huh. It's not an ideal solution because even in winter here, it can get above 12 degrees, you know, sometimes. And there is weather fluctuation, but they get a few months below 10. You know, it, the average temperature goes down to, you know, eight, six. You can sleep there. Um, it can go below freezing. And what I do with those is that I get, uh, I fill, half fill the box with soil, dirt, basically. Um, I put bricks at the bottom to show up the area. <laughs> um, and then some sort of flat pieces of bark on top of that. And then I fill in the rest of it and I leave a hole for them to go in. And then I'll put in like sphagnum or dead leaves or whatever, you know, to refill in the rest of the box. I put it out in the shed and I forget about it for a few months. Now, in the wild, we know the months that these snakes brumate. So the Korean rats which bear in mind come from slightly warmer environments in China, will start entering brumation from November and they will be out February to March. That's still a good four or five months. The Russian rats can brumate six months of the year though in some areas. So they're going in at, at uh, October and coming out in March. So six months of the year hibernating. Um, the Japanese rats, it will vary because Japan, like the climate varies a bit more. Uh, I brumate them the same as I do with the others, though. I put them in under 10 degrees. Um, I suppose they'll conform to whatever you decide to do anyway, won't they? Yeah, they're all captive bred multiple generations at this point. So um, I, I've bred Japanese rats without brumation, and they've bred just fine. Uh, but I like to brumate them because it may have an effect on their longevity as well. It does on rat snakes in Canada, which similar climatic conditions to the Russian rats, I suppose. Um, and as we discussed in the brumation video, that resulted in a 10-year difference in lifespan. Now, I brumate mine, and I've got animals here that are 30 years, you know, give or take a year or two for both species. So something is, you know, I'm doing something right, is, is what I'll say. Um, and they certainly come out of brumation with a very pronounced breeding drive. Once they shed and they, they become active, it's, uh, 
it's all go. <laughs> So obviously, when you have them in these tubs, like, do, do you know what sort of humidity you're going for? Because I think when I when I actually uh, brumated my kings, I think I had a bit too humid. Actually, they actually they came out a bit sneezy. Obviously, that just cleared up when they got to their like warm basking spots and UV and whatnot. But so that does depend on the snake, the type of species. You know, the species that you're brumating. Like kings are not desert species, but more scrubland species. These guys brumate near to water. Now, you don't want it to be too humid. Um, that's why I use the bigger tubs, to be honest, because smaller tubs, they can get humid quite quick, and I don't want that. So I use the big tubs. It's full of soil and coir, just dirt. You will find that there is condensation on there, but in these species, I've never noticed it to be an issue. If you notice that it's too much, you take the lid off, you shake it off, you put it down again. Um, I've never gone for the whole using hygrometers to measure humidity for things like that. If you're talking about species from drier areas, I'm sure it will be much more of an issue. And certainly too much humidity can be a killer during brumation, but it doesn't seem to impact these guys at all. Um, so Russian rats, Anomala and Natrix, so, you know, when I was keeping the various Natrix species, they, they were completely unfazed and... I would actually go as far to say that even 10 degrees is too high for them. Um, you could put them down below five and they would be just fine as well. You know, and I've done that. I've done that down to two degrees and the Natrix and the Shrenke have been active, you know, so they're still alert. Um, so I have no doubt that they can take those low temperatures for a while. Um, yeah, I think I actually uh, brumated mine a bit too humid. I think what I'm going to do this year is have like holes in the tubs and then like tape them, and then I can like modulate it by like taking off, like untaping one and like playing with the the ventilation that way. So, what makes you think it was too humid? Out of curiosity. So I, I it, there was condensation, um, and uh, I was there will be condensation. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, but there was quite a fair bit. But they were also drinking from it, so that's why I left yeah, it. it was I mean, like, that's why I like it. If, if they will drink from it and become active. They kept flipping over their water bottles, which is why I was preferring to leave it, so they had water. Yeah, some people don't even put the water bowls um, the full time, and they just do it weekly. I've tried that. It's too much of an effort. Um, with the fridges, nowadays I do that. Um just because you like a fridge, you just open the door, you can take the boxes out and offer them once a week a bit of water if they want it. But yeah. with the, the stuff outside, it's, it would just be too much of a palaver to you know, stack them and so on. Um, but you said that it was coming out sniffy. Yeah, all, all three of them came out like sneezing, not like continuously, it was just very now and again. Was that like pre shed or? It was pre shed, yeah. Because sometimes like snakes do that before they shed, they just get like fits where they just start doing that. Um, I'm not saying that it wasn't due to condensation, but sometimes, like the snakes, they, they just act like they've got a cold before, right before they shed. So it I'll hear be. my um, royals and I'll hear a wheeze, mm. and I'll like get them out, and then I'll see that they're pink, and I'll, I'll... never mind. Yeah, so it could be that. Um, but I had never experienced it the years before I brumated them, which is why I thought it might have been because of that. But it, like it, it went anyway. So yeah, but it also went with a shed, so it could have been that. All's well that ends well, though. You got breathing and all that done, so that was a, a good result. Um, on that note, I mean, like, one of the sad things about having animals that live that long is just witnessing senescence. And having said that, I've said this the last three years, that the big male is, this is going to be the last winter for the big male, and every year it's pulled through. This year I'm, I've chosen not to hibernate the biggest male Russian rat, as it's, it's either 30 or 31, because um, it wasn't a baby when I got it. I don't know the exact age. And you can just see now that it's start, it's slowing down. It's starting to sort of shrink. Like there's there's like folds in its neck. That atrophy it's, starting to come in. Yeah, it, it's senescence. It's getting old, you know, and you can, you can visibly see it. It starts slowing down. And yet it still eats fine. I mean, you know, I, I give him smaller prey a bit more often. It moves around quite a lot. It's so... I don't know how long it's going to live, but I would not be surprised. I'd be very upset, but I'm not, I would not be surprised um, if it goes at some point during this winter, this one. And, you know, I'll cry buckets for it. It's, it's, you know, it's been with me most of my life. You know, it's, it's when you think about it, 30 years, um, you know, and I will be with you that long. It's like twice as long as most cats or dogs will live. So, 
you know, these can be very long lived animals. Um, but, so, in yeah. terms of keeping them, are they are they all like cohabitable? Yes, very much so. Um, Russian rats and Korean rats are fine. They like some people will sometimes report they fight over food, but if you're cohabiting, you shouldn't be feeding them together anyway. You should be giving some space and watching them so that you know if you if you put one on one side of the viv and one on the other, let them eat. Um, obviously, if you take your eyes off them and wander off and come back, one might have finished first and gone after the second one, and they might be fighting over the food. Yeah, but you should watch them if you're feeding them in the same viv. The Japanese rats, I cohabit lots, and I, I have quite a lot of Japanese rats. I've got a number of adult pairs and a few um, sub-adults growing on. I would say it's you may as well save yourself some hassle and not cohabit them, because if you get animals that are really uh, high feeding response, they will just constantly fight over food. Once they're fed, they get sort of very high strung and they start looking, they're still roving around looking for more and you can see them scuffle a bit. It doesn't harm them, but why bother? You know, that said, I keep mine together in pairs or groups, but the enclosures are large and tall. Um, and that's another thing I, I should have mentioned when we were talking about enclosure size. Height. Both, you know, all three species are, are uh, semi arboreal They will climb. I've got pictures sent to me by Mark Bastado from Russia, where he's found them like 20 feet up a tree. Um, I believe you said about having three feet of height. I mean, that is yeah. more than what most give, I think. I, I think adults should, if you can give them three feet, it's not a necessity. They'll do fine in a six by two by two. I've got like sub adults and, and near adults and six by two by twos. Yeah, they'll, they'll do fine in those. But the big animals I keep in, in six by threes and they use every inch of that height. You, you give them the trunks and all that. It's nice. Why wouldn't you? I mean, if, if you don't have the space, well, you can make do with two feet of height. I'm not going to judge it. But Sky hides and whatnot, yeah. They, they definitely like the ability to climb. I would even say that if you have a the option between a four by two by two or a three by two by three for a Japanese rat, I think, because they're slimmer, I think a three by two by three might even be a better option if you had to pick. Um, and I, I've got, you know, sub adults in, in three by threes and they climb. It doesn't seem too small for them. I liked, you know, and, and they've got that sort of vertical length as well. Um, but once they get to six feet, that's, you know, we, we're talking sub adults here. Six feet would be four by three at the minimum if you wanted to give three by. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't house a six foot animal in anything less than a four foot. And I would strongly push for the six foot if you at all can. Um, if not, maybe it's better to go for something a bit smaller. Dion's rat snake, very similar in care requirements, a third of the size. Perfect. There's a lot of Dion's like localities and morphs as well. There's yeah, a lot a of very, very pretty potential projects of that species, yeah. Twin spotted rat snakes by Maculata, mm -hmm. again, even smaller, you know, three feet max. Um, and the males smaller still, colourful, hardy, you know, fantastic pets. And, you know, you could keep those in a two-foot viv. I mean, but, you know, a three-foot would be big for one, and a four-foot would be fantastic for adults. You know, that would be like a palace for them. So this is the, it's the option between providing an absolute palace for a smaller animal or merely an okay enclosure for a bigger animal. That's the, the choice. I'm not going to dissuade anyone from picking which species they want but for me personally i'd rather have a dion's in a four by two by two than a russian rat in a four by two by two you know but that's you know that's picking the animal that fits your enclosure um you certainly could keep the russian in the four by two by two it just would look a bit small for it in my opinion so i think any listeners who are big Russian rat fans would uh, would absolutely love the whole natural history and what France has gone into. The fact that you can remember how which of the vertebrae, what number it was, like how is that even possible? I am convinced you, uh, you sit there like a. I'll tell you the truth is that I actually wrote that one down years ago in AHH. I actually did a a video of the Clamacophora eating eggs, and I I found the number of vertebrae on a paper. And since then, I kind of tend to read things and remember them. So I know now that the Climacophora have got up to the 49th vertebrae, you know, and the the, the um, 
the Russia, the Russians and Anomala up to the 45th. I think I actually listed a lot of them. It's crazy. Um, He's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Um, but oh, it next, definitely is interesting, yeah. Once, once you've brumated them, then the next thing is breeding them. And that's the... Uh, it's easy. If you brumate them, then you can breed them. Um, they're, they're easy to breed. If you can breed corn snakes, you can certainly breed these things. Like, if you've got a male and a female and you put them together, they will mate. Um, all three species. Uh, there are fewer anomala around, and I've had less success with them, but you know, if you breed them, you breed them. Um, the, the Russians are very easy and the babies hatch out really large. I mean, the babies hatch out about 45 centimeters up to like, you know, quite large. So I mean, just, wow. I've got a tape measure here. Yeah, yeah. About 40 to 45 centimeters for the Russians. They're, they're, they're big when they hatch out. I've seen smaller at shows and I don't know whether or not my ones, again, I've said this before with corn snakes as well, that my ones lay fewer, larger eggs. But mine it lay... It could be like double clutching as well and the second lot are smaller or something as well. I don't know. I've never seen either species double clutch, to be honest. I've never seen Japanese rats double clutch. And I've, like, I keep them together as adults year round. Um, I don't recall ever seeing Russians double clutch, although I'm not going to be as sure on that one. Uh, I think they, they breed once, but, you know, if somebody has then it wouldn't surprise me either i just this is my experience um the russian rats are smaller so the russian rats i would say hatch out 25 centimeters maybe um i've sent you some photos of babies of both from this year um and they're much thinner so they look more like corn snakes when they hatch out but they eat pinkies really easily i've never had really any problems with either the Russians and, and the Koreans gobble down pinks. Like, they're not shy at all. And they are on to even chicks within a year or two. Like, they, they grow quite quick. Uh, the, the Japanese, sometimes they refuse, but the Japanese babies are much more strike-happy. So, like the Kotrips, either what I do is I pin the mid-body on a flat surface and I get them to strike. And always, the ones that refuse drop their food. If they strike and bite, they always eat. Um, and then the very, very few outliers that don't, if you assist feed it, it will eat. Like it just starts biting and then you gently let it go and it will continue to chew. I've never had them hold out. Like they're just really, really solid babies, easy to uh, get going. Incubation, I can tell you the dates of incubation for this year. So as I remember them because I was on holiday. So the, the Japanese rats laid on the 14th of May and they were hatching by the 7th of June. Uh, sorry, 7th of July. So the, the Japanese rats incubation varies from about 40 to 60 days. Um, I incubate generally quite a low temperature. So I, I've even incubated them at room temperature and they've hatched, even like, especially the Russians. When I was younger and I didn't have access to all of the technology, you know, I used to literally just put them in an ice cream tub uh, with sawdust and just wet the sawdust and the Russian rat eggs will hatch. It just takes three months rather than like two and a half. Um, but nowadays, I kind of aim for about 24, 25 degrees. So it's it's on the lower end. Um, but So potentially room temperature if you're in a reptile room. Uh, yeah, basically. I mean, my reptile room is usually around 23, which is nice. Um, but in the summer, it can get a bit warmer, and then I've got to start looking at monitoring stuff. But I, I incubate around 25, 24 to 25 for those species, and they hatch out fine. The Japanese rats, I have incubated higher. I've incubated them as high as 28, but I would say somewhere between 25 and 27 is the sweet spot for those, in my experience. Um, I think that's pretty much everything. <laughs> so how many... Um, how many... Let me ask the question again. I was, trying, <laughs> I was trying to mix how many eggs and what the clutch size, and just completely just failed on a sentence what are the clutch sizes roughly of each species then so uh, and i remember this as well the the least the smallest clutch size i've had from climacophora was six eggs and the largest was 16 or 17 the shrinky around eight to nine is average but they're big eggs they can they can lay a lot more um like I, I'm pretty sure I remember seeing records of like up to 16 or 17 eggs, 
but I tend to get around eight eggs from mine. Um, but they're, they're quite large eggs. And they're bigger than corn snake eggs. Um, and the babies hatch out large. Um, so they, they're... They're not huge producers, you know, but then, but then again, if you look at Dion's, some of my Dion's only lay four eggs in a season sometimes. Um, so, but they can also go higher. They can go for up to 12 or more, but, you know, it, it varies. But I've got animals that will lay four eggs, but the eggs are like twice the size of another animal's eggs. So it's that's quite a variable question. Really, isn't yeah, it? it's, it's interesting because different sized females of different ages seem to lay different sizes. But I think that applies with a lot of snakes, to be honest. Um, I recorded the coach whips and I had two different female coach whips lay this year. And I actually measured, you know, took photos of the different eggs. And I think one was 50 millimeters long, but then I had another one which was like nearly 70 millimeters long. It was just like massively larger. And oddly enough, the smaller female laid the bigger eggs and fewer of them. So I don't know what, you know, necessarily what factors lead up to that um, but it seems to vary quite a lot but one thing I will say is that the babies are easy to get feeding like even easier than corn snakes they, they're just ravenous um, and you know once you've got them eating pinkies and all that as with any I mean because if you imagine a, a Russian rat snake hatchling in the wild if it's a 45 centimeter snake 50 centimeter snake that could overpower voles and shrews and, and small mice because, you know, a lot of wild rodents are smaller than lab rodents that we're used to. And I know this because even Dion's, I found young Dion's rat snake, which are a considerably smaller species, but I found them in the same size bracket, 30 to 45 centimeters. And they've had a massive stomach full of food and it's literally been an adult rodent that they've eaten. So somehow these little baby snakes have gone out and overpowered an adult rodent and, and <laughs> eaten it. So That's really could, cool, isn't it? Yeah, they, they certainly hit above their weight. Um, so I have absolutely no uh, doubt whatsoever that a baby uh, Russian rat could take on an adult mouse right out of the egg. Um, and it would not be long at all before they're big enough to take most rodents. You know, I've seen photos by Shin Yuichol and Kim Hyuntai of the adults tackling rats, you know, rat snakes. They do take adult rats. Um in captivity, I noticed that they seem to prefer smaller prey. That said, the, the big Russian rats love rats. Like, they really go crazy over rats. Some of my Koreans seem to be a bit more scared or wary of the rats. They will take them, but they prefer, like, like they hammer mice quicker. The Klamakophora will, will, will eat anything, including you, um, you know, if you move <laughs> anything. But, but then again, that's also because of the way I feed the animals, Um it's a snake in a box. The box is four feet long. These are animals that you regularly see moving, you know, on video. You, you see them moving all over the place. They swim across water. Um, so feeding is a is one of those times where they would get exercise. So I've always fed my animals by teasing them, making them chase the prey, and then constrict it. So even when, when they've grabbed it and they're, they're wrapped around it, I still jiggle it a bit to make them tighten up and actually make it an event where they simulate killing it. I'm certain they can tell the difference between a dead prey and a live one because I've seen coach whips act completely differently with live prey than they do with dead prey. Some of the coach whips have been wild caught and needed to start on a few uh, feeds of live prey. So that's how I noticed there is a difference in behavior. But I certainly make the adults just chase the, the prey, you know, to get it. And I think that results in very alert and active and switched on animals that are always ready for when the door opens to come out looking for food. I certainly wouldn't do that with a larger python, for example, because that would be just <laughs> downright dangerous um, because you're, it's associating the door opening and the keeper with food that it has to chase. Yeah, play that game or eat it, see how that goes. Yeah, it's, it's almost like the opposite of what Laurie does, you know, with, with the target train and all that. It's, um, although I suppose if you target train it to recognise the target first, then it wouldn't matter. You know, that'd be something that'd be interesting to uh, look into. So we've covered natural history, uh, also taxonomy. We've covered the breeding, the brumation, the heating, lighting, the care. Um, another question that I would normally ask someone about the market, but that doesn't really apply to you, does it? I mean, I breed all three species regularly. Um, up until last year, I was actually feeding off the eggs of the Japanese rat snakes because 
nobody was buying. Um, and, you know, like people get really triggered when I say, oh, I feed the eggs off. And they'll say, oh, why do you breed them at all then? Well, because I brumate them and I cycle them and it's natural. And I do actually believe that breeding is a massive form of enrichment for them. Like you can see that they act different. Some of the males will go off food during the breeding season until they've mated. Well, that's why. So, you know, if the animals are healthy, it's not actually that much of a burden for them because they're in captivity. They don't experience, you know, massive shifts in climate change. They don't experience predation. They're being fed, you know, on a schedule. They've got as much food as they want. So why not? Um, so, you know, the eggs, I was literally just feeding to other animals. Like I've got oligodon, uh, kukri snakes, which eat eggs. I've got coach whips, which eat eggs. I've got skinks, which eat eggs. You know, it's a valuable source of food. But, you know, I've started rearing a few more nowadays just because, you know, I, I kind of miss them. And a lot of my animals are getting older, so I'll, I'll have to replace some of them eventually if I want to keep keeping them. Uh, and people ask. So I know um, there are a few people that this year have got my animals. I took some to Chaz. Um, and I will from now on as well. So I suppose if you want Francis Cuscari animals, Snakes and Adders is going to be one of the places to uh, to get them going forward. Um, is your blue are your blue rat snakes are you breed uh, your Jap the Japs are you breeding those? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um... they they will all breed, <laughs> but uh, when I say they're blue, they're not like the bright blue like Raina Thessa's Gonyosoma Prasinum. You know, they're not like sky blue, they're like a dullish blue. They're they're not green, they're bluish, but it's like a grayish slaty blue. The Kunashir Island animals have got sky blue heads, but only in the breeding season. Um, but it's like bright blue, that is. Um I haven't seen many of like that around, I have to be honest. So those are quite nice. Um, in fact, the, one of the ones I took to Chaz was a baby of one of those. Um, I traded the rest for something really cool. Um, Hemorrhois rabergeria, uh, the Uzbekistan black-headed whip snakes. I kind of got made an offer I couldn't refuse. So I'm like, yeah, I'll give you some of these for some of those. Um, rough and rat snakes. That's mostly yeah. how you operate, isn't it? It's trades rather than yeah. your... Yeah. I, I would rather... So, I mean, I would never breed a lot. For, and the main reason is that I, being honest, I don't want to interact with too many people and have them around my house. And, you know, it's, I'm just not that kind of person. Some people are very sociable. I'm not, being honest. Um, so, you know, and also when I find homes for my babies, I prefer to make sure that they're placed with keepers that I know will keep them to a standard that meets my expectations. A lot of people take umbrage with that and it's like well i bred them they're my animals i've it's my responsibility to make sure that they're kept at the welfare level that i personally espouse i'm not going to judge the way other people keep their animals but these are now my animals that i produce and i feel responsible for so yes i do ask a lot of questions i ask to see how the animals are kept that said you know with Chaz, i've sat with Chaz multiple times now and literally just sat with him for six to eight hours and watched how he interacts with customers and how he makes a sale. And I know that he like really probes hard and, and won't sell the animal to people that he thinks won't keep them well. So I trust him, you know, to say, you know what, you can do that bit. I'll, I'll let you have the animals and you sell them for me. You know, that works. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm much happier doing that than sort of looking all over the place and finding homes to place them at, which is very work intensive. You know, knowing that there's a professional shop owner that does that and that actually I trust to actually give the good advice and make sure that they are kept properly, it's a weight off the mind. So I'm much happier doing that nowadays. Um, but yeah, ideally, if you are going to offer me money or a cool other snake that I don't have, I will always pick the cool snake. And that's how we used to do it. You know, if I've bred horseshoe whip snakes, which are really popular, not like I, I will never lack people that want horseshoe whip snakes because they're quite difficult to get in the UK. Well, those are, I save for people that can give me something I want in return, you know? Um, so that's just the way I prefer to do it. You know, I'm not really money oriented. I think vast amounts of money, but like my, my, my wife would say accusingly into my own hobby, but I'm not really looking to make money off it. It's, it's a hobby. It's not a profit driven enterprise, but if you can, proliferate my hobby by offering me animals I might not necessarily otherwise get either I wouldn't buy them or I wouldn't have access to them then yeah I'd rather trade animals that I bred for that that's that's cool that's the best way of doing things in my opinion but you know 
Each their own, fair enough. Each their own, yeah. I'm not going to judge people. There's nothing wrong inherently with making money. I don't judge it. You know, I, you know, people can make money. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm just not interested in it. You know, and I and I don't want that to be the primary focus of my hobby and why I breed. I think that that can be a rabbit hole for some. Yeah, fair enough. So I think we've covered everything now, literally everything. So I think we're coming up to the, I think it's nearly, two, nearly the two hour mark. Not again. Yeah. <laughs> this one wouldn't be as long as well. Just We're just 10 minutes off the two hour mark. So I think that we've covered everything. I think both fans, the Jap- Japanese rats, the Koreans and the, the Russian rat snakes will enjoy this. So thank you very much for coming on the podcast, Francis. No, no problem at all. Good to see you both again.